Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hey everyone, welcome back. This week I am sharing an edited clip from a recent course that I gave. It was a career strategy mini course and really helping people understand in this job market, wondering, should I stay? Should I go? How do I create clarity around what it is that I want and also create a career strategy? So if you're finding yourself like anxious or wondering what's next, In this mini course, I gave the state of the Q3, Q4 2022 job market and the mental recession that we're in, a new take on resume, some of the the best tips to really beat the applicant tracking software, also known as the ATS, why those higher level $150,000 US dollar plus level jobs are not posted on job boards and what you can do instead. We talk through some ways to answer salary range questions. We also talk about well, how do you answer questions when you don't actually have obvious results to um, to talk about your experience and your achievements. And what this clip is, is the three BS blockers that completely mess up your career. So if you're interested in this course, you know what? It is still available and it's only $29. So I'm going to put the link in the show notes. If you're following me on Instagram, and I hope you are, you can also get the link there. The course comes with um, basically four video modules. There's worksheets. You'll get immediate access to building out your career identity blueprint. And it's really going to help you understand, like, as you work through this next quarter, how do you want to be approaching your job, whether you're staying in your job or going? Everything in this course is absolutely helpful for you. And you'll get access to all this content for six months. And it's $29. Wanted to make it really easy and accessible for everyone. So give a listen in. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me at hello at jillgriffincoaching.com or hit me up on Instagram, follow me on LinkedIn, send me messages there because I love hearing from you and I really appreciate you all. All right, my friends, have a great day and give a listen. I'll talk to you soon. What I have seen is that there are three, I call them three BS blocks, three belief systems. They're also known as bullshit. Three bullshit blocks that I find that are consistently blocking people's career. And the odds are that you have had or experienced this. I mean, it could be for a day, it could be for an hour, it could be for you know an entire run at a particular job that you were working on. And they are imposter syndrome, people pleasing, and perfectionism. And perfectionism and people pleasing tend to be sisters of each other. They tend to really lock in. But what I'm going to talk about today is the more sneaky, stealthy ways. Because if you're on any of like Pinterest or Instagram, you've probably seen, you know, people talking about these, these conditions. Um, and I should actually, I should probably shouldn't call it conditions because they're not diagnosis. It's about mindset, but there are plenty of people who are talking about them, but I find that they show up in really, really stealthy ways. And what we're talking about is like, as so many of us are achievers, but we may be anxious achievers and high performing achievers. And we go from feeling good to feeling bad really quickly. And we don't always know why. And when it comes to imposter syndrome, it's often the fear that 
we feel like we're going to lose out on the job or we're going to lose the job because we're not qualified. So when we don't address it, what happens is that it's going to prevent us in so many ways from really being fully active because we're always going to try to censor ourselves where, you know, there's constant chatter and constant negative thinking in our head. And we're going to continue to want to chase the wheel, right? It's the dopamine response cycle. So dopamine is the anticipation drug. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Whether it's cake, alcohol, or the job, it's still, it's still the anticipation. But what happens so often, especially in the way that we all work, is we never stop to appreciate that we got it. We never actually let ourselves feel the emotion of getting it. So because we don't know we got it, we still keep wanting it, right? So that's one of the things that happens with imposter syndrome is that we don't realize that we have it. We don't realize we've achieved it. So we keep having to chase it. Then we're othered. We can be in an environment in which we're the only one of a particular gender. We're the only one who had a different experience, right? One of these things doesn't look like the others. And then we start to think that, something about our experience isn't right. And that for me also is a big trigger to warning to yourself to know that like, well, if you're female or non-binary, you're never going to be male. So you are going to be quote othered. So it's not imposter syndrome because you can't actually be the thing. So you just want to, I mean, it's, it's still a, um, it's still a mindset fuck, right? But it's not actually imposter syndrome because you can't be what you literally cannot be. Um, So what we're also finding is that the way imposter syndrome and what I see show up is ways in which, you know, we're reluctant to speak in a group meeting. Um, The idea of Teams or Zooms or, you know, Google Meets, like we're really, really holding back and we're not participating because we feel like we're going to get stepped on if we're, you know, trying to get in there or it just feels like, uh, you know, this never works. Um, Other ways is that we over-prepare or we under pursue opportunities so that we're like, you know what, it's not actually going to work anyway. So I'm just going to like do the bare minimum. So you're almost like in the pre-traumatic stress of it. Like you're setting yourself up in advance for not succeeding against it or pursue trainings and certifications. So that thinking that when we get the next thing, the next one outside of ourselves, then we'll feel like we've, we're, we're okay. Or we're good enough or we're qualified for this particular role. And that never happens because anything outside of myself, if I, I'm always going to be chasing it. Meaning if someone told me I looked a certain way and I wanted to believe it, it's outside of me. I have to keep having someone tell me that. Otherwise I'm never going to believe it. I have to realize it myself. Other ways that it is, is like having uh, face a new professional challenge, right? It could be downplaying your success, your successes. It can also be if you're a freelancer or a consultant. Um, allowing scope creep. It can also be, I know I watch you smile. Um, It could also be not raising your prices or when you go to hand the scope over to someone, they don't even negotiate with you because they're like, oh, that's it. Or that's what they're thinking, right? So those are some of the ways that imposter syndrome definitely comes up. So when you think to yourself, okay, so how do I fix this? It's like, well, it's not about positive thinking or trying to avoid the feeling. It's not because you're going to have like your mom or your bestie tell you that you're fantastic or good enough because that's other people's opinions, which is about them. And that's never going to soothe you. And it's never about compliments and it's never about the dollar in your bank, the dollar amount in your bank account. None of that is ever going to make you feel like you've arrived. It's absolutely about practicing new thoughts and creating new beliefs. So the biggest thing that I find as the fastest way to start shifting from this is I want you to make a list of your accomplishments. Now we can go back as far as you want, but even if you just wrote down three to five recent accomplishments, promotions, achievements at work, finalizing a piece of business and closing out the scope and knowing that you served the client, you know, at the highest level that you could. And, you know, it's mutually beneficial for all. I want you to think about those accomplishments And it's really sitting for a moment in the feeling of the accomplishment. Do you feel pride, honored, appreciative, focused? Do you feel excellence? Do you feel warrior and championship energy? 
right? What do you feel? And sit in that for a few seconds. So when I say few seconds, like I'd love for you to sit in it for 10 seconds, but a few sentences sit in it. And why do we do that? Because the way the brain is wired is based on evolutionary biology. Your brain does three things. It seeks pleasure, food, procreation. It avoids pain, fire, crazy emails from clients. And then the last thing it does is it seeks efficiency, which is what keeps you alive. It's the reason why you can put your hands on your keyboard and you don't have to retrain yourself every day how to type. It's the reason why you, when you pick up a pen, you know instantly how to handle it and you know how to write. It's that efficiency, right? You may have heard of neuroplasticity. The neurons in our head, when things are firing together, they wire together. So when we're constantly doing the same thing, we literally create new pathways, new neural pathways to keep doing something. So all of this thinking is based on the efficiency that your brain is. What was the last thought? The last thought is I got to do better. Okay, that's our thing. Pull it out of the file. Got to do better. Keep working on got to do better. What my work is with people, and it's subtle, but it's really freaking powerful, is think about a rocking chair on a carpet. You keep rocking it, rocking it, rocking it. There are grooves in that carpet. I'm teaching you how to move the rocking chair. I'm teaching you how to move neuroplasticity and have new ways of thinking. So coming back to the evolutionary biology, when your brain is shooting off, oh my God, I got to do better. And that's creating a feeling of imposter syndrome or anxiety or fear. It is biologically impossible for you to be in the negative sensation of fear or lack or doubt or anxiety and be in the solution. It's fight or flight. You have to drop one of them. So really sitting in the feeling of the accomplishment, which is going to make you feel good When that feeling starts to dissipate, writing down your thoughts around that is how you start to move forward. Because then each time you have the negative thought, you experience it, you let it go. You get yourself to think about, okay, let me think about an accomplishment I have. You experience it, you let it go, and then you move forward with, okay, I'm feeling focused. I'm feeling determined. I could do this. I could do this again. You start literally changing your thinking. It does involve practice, but this is exactly how this is based on positive behavioral psychology. Um, You know, this is exactly how you start creating new neural pathways and working. And it takes work. I mean, you know, when people say like, well, how long is it going to take? It's like, well, how, how big is the thought? Right. Um, You know, You may have a disagreement with someone, feel uncomfortable, but it fades after a week. All right, so that only takes maybe a little bit of work. You may have been walking around for years feeling like an imposter and that you're going to continue to be found out at every job you work in. And that's going to take daily practice probably a couple of times a day to be able to move through that. Okay, so the next belief one is perfectionism. And perfectionism is really just scared people, right? It means that, I mean, perfectionism doesn't mean that you're perfect. We know this, but that you're trying to be perfect, but there's no, there's no perfect. Like I was even reading recently um, around the IOC, the Internet, the Olympics committee and how a 10 is actually not about perfection. It's about, there are bands of what you need to do at each rating point in order to get that score. So the perfect score is something that the media has taken on and said that a 10 is a perfect score. Okay. So it's the highest score, but it doesn't mean you're perfect. People have gotten a 10 in sports um, competitions and actually not been perfect. So it's such an interesting thing when you pull it back into thinking that you're chasing something that looks like perfection and it just simply doesn't exist. What happens often is that you're living in extremes. You're carrying a scorecard that every day you're either winning or failing. And it's going to show up very often with people in that they're going to hold themselves back. They're not going to want to compete against the goal because the idea of getting feedback or criticism or failing feels too big for them. So they don't want that. And then they're at times also showing up where they're 
seeking validation from others. Like, is this okay? Is this work good enough? Do I need to fix this? Did you like what I sent? Right. You're constantly checking with other people. Now I get it. We work for people. So we do have to meet the standards of whatever the requirements are of the job, but you have to give that validation to yourself first and be like, is this the best job you could have done with the time, the resources and the knowledge you have? And if the answer is yes to that, as Seth Godin would say, you got to ship, you got to move forward. You've got to get it out the door. And yeah, there might be feedback, but you have to bifurcate the feedback of you versus the project. So one of the other ways is like, you're being, you're afraid to be called incompetent or you feel like, You're going to take the feedback personally. And then what starts to happen is that your worth is connected to productivity and activity and busyness versus value. So your worth, based on how much you're doing, you are either worth more or worth less based on your own brain. So as someone like myself who spent the bulk of her career in strategy, there would be days on end where I didn't physically produce anything because I'm doing the research, I'm doing the market research, I'm collecting data. And early on in my career, this would bother me until I figured out that this can't, like creating value and being busy, don't, there's there's nothing to do with each other. They're on opposite sides of the stick. Being busy is exactly that. You're busy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're creating value. So when you're thinking about perfectionism, really understanding that you're always looking for the satisfaction that you're get, getting a good job. You you don't let yourself be celebrated, but you let other people tell you that you're doing a good job and that you're constantly focusing on lack, the lack of, but you're not, it's like almost calls into also like thinking about, well, I didn't hit all of these things. So therefore it wasn't good enough. And I just want to be clear that I'm not confusing perfectionism with ambition. Striving for big goals and big things is great. It's how we grow. But a lot of perfectionists actually don't achieve their goals because they're never, they're never fully finishing because they don't want that actual feedback. You think that if you think and acted perfectly, you would minimize like blame and judgment and shame. And it's, it just, it's not true. It's never, you know, you don't want to be hurt. You don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to experience the failure, but experiencing that failure and mistakes are necessary for growth. And again, the worst thing that can happen to you today is a feeling. I'm not saying it feels great. Failure can feel really crummy in the initial moment, but processing that through is where you start to create what's next for you. So we're not talking about lowering your expectations. We're talking about creating awareness. We're talking about really looking at how do you want to approach this particular project? You want to think about what's the inspirational goal, what's the medium goal, and what's the minimum requirement. So I don't mean bare minimum to do. I don't mean um, the worst job ever. I mean, what does success look like at the minimum, the medium, and the inspirational? And sometimes you're going to hit that inspirational. But as you're going through your work, really deciding what's realistic based on the time, resources, and data you have, and constantly separating story from fact. Because if you can't prove the thought that's in your head, And it's really easy to say, can you prove it? Yeah, this is true. Okay, prove it. I can't prove it, right? Then you know that it is story and not fact. You really want to think about really, it's it's a similar thing where you're, you're tapping into that fear. You're allowing that fear to process through your body and that you're thinking about, okay, what does it actually mean for this project to be successful? What are my own requirements? And they may change every time. And just know that it's not going to happen every day. It's like a small peeling back and really shifting out of that perfectionism. And again, this is another area where working with a coach or a therapist is going to be really, really, really helpful to help you constantly see what your mind is doing to you and that it's setting unrealistic. That I find that is so um, impactful within our belief system is the people pleasing. And this one is like, this one is so sneaky and stealthy where it people pleasing is self-abandonment at its core. And it's also a lie. 
It's this somewhere in the in your life, you learn rules that you in your brain and the way you move through society, both within your family and um, people around you, that there was a rule, there was a reward. And if you follow the rule and reward, I mean, if you followed the rule, you got the reward. So something happens where along the way, you do something, you get the praise, you do something, you get the reward. And then because people are messy, at some point you do it but the person didn't respond to you, didn't give you the reward. So you work a little harder. Oh, okay, you got the reward again. Then again, at some point you stop getting it. So what you're doing is you're constantly moving the bar higher and higher and higher and higher, which is why people pleasing and perfectionism are sisters of each other. You don't necessarily have to have both, but a lot of people do at times experience both. And you find that somewhere along the lines, like you're in this cycle And where I find people pleasing comes most commonly in the workplace is through two places, either one, the overachiever or two, the quiet seeker. So the overachiever is coming from, you try to be proactive. You try to anticipate everyone's needs. You try to read their minds. You're overworking to get the credit. You're always jumping in for the opportunity. Um, Because again, you want to have that reward. You want someone to say, oh, good job, Jill. Like we really needed your help on that. You're feeding off that. And, you know, you may not always answer questions honestly, because you're afraid it might not make yourself look good, or you give some sort of like BS answer. And it's all because you're trying to police others. You're trying to put their, you're guessing what they're thinking. And then you're trying to act as accordingly to what you think they're thinking. And then you want to do enough, but not too much. You want to be strong, but not too strong. You definitely want to be over, you know, friendly, but you don't want to be overbearing and and, and too much. And then, you know, you want to be firm, but you don't want to alienate others. And then you want to be opinionated, but not so much that you start to insult people. You can see like, oh my God, this just turns into a level of burnout. It's exhausting. And there's the external burnout, which is the physical impact of overworking, overthinking. And then there's the internal burnout, which happens to a people pleaser where they then turn around and they start really beating themselves up. Why did you do this again? So you have two kinds of burnout. There's the, what's physically happening and then your own beat up job to yourself. The other way that I find that it shows up is through the quiet worker. And this is the idea that you've unconsciously decided that your own growth isn't going to make everyone happy. So you're just going to keep doing the job. You find a way to shrink perhaps to fit in. You're always saying yes to the impossible deadline without renegotiating. You're taking on so many responsibilities, more than you can comfortably manage because you don't want to disappoint anyone. And then you're remaining quiet in group settings, mainly because you want to maintain harmony. And even though you may disagree or have other thoughts or feelings around it, you don't actually share them. So being afraid to being asked for those bigger opportunities, those raises, those promotions, not speaking up openly in your career, it's going to obviously impact your career. And the the thing that I find so interesting about the, the quiet worker is that their peers may know the contribution they bring, but leadership doesn't. So this idea of like, I'm going to do this to get a reward or because I have to doesn't work. So then you start to feel really frustrated and resentful. And then you you're not comfortable with saying no or renegotiating the priorities. So again, when it comes to that, I, I, it's the same thing, right? The, the symptom may look different, but at the end of the day, the root cause is always coming back to everything we do in life is because of how we want to feel or because of a feeling we want to avoid. There's never an exception. And we don't want to always feel the feeling of, oh, I have to say no to you. What are you going to think of me? I have to disappoint you. What am I going to think of me? All right, I'll just do it anyway. And we don't want to feel that tension, that discomfort, maybe at times a debate or an argument. So we keep giving of ourselves. And again, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't work. So where you do there is really understanding that, that when you clean up your emotions and that you really separate yourself, it's almost like a codependency and stop constantly being the chameleon and peeling back those layers little by little and processing your own negative emotions around it, you can really start to shift things. Identify that, you know, there's going to be a powerful emotion. 
You may need to say no to someone. You may need to renegotiate with a boss or a client or a colleague. Breathing, allowing the feeling again to come up, really noticing, oh God, look, I feel it in my chest. Huh, now it's in my stomach. Oh wow, it's in my shoulders. And just doing that processing of the emotion again soothes the primitive brain so it can calm down and realize it's not dying from this experience. And then you can get back into the prefrontal cortex and think again. So again, even though all three of these situations are different ways that it shows up, the antidote to all of them is the same in that you have to process what you're feeling. Again, you can once you learn how to do it, you can do it on your own. I always recommend that you do it with a coach or a therapist or someone who's trained to help you process that so that you can separate everything, like the story from the fact, and then get back into using your strategic prefrontal cortex to decide where you want to go from there. And those are the three biggest blocks that I see that totally mess up people's careers. Okay, folks. So you just listened in on one of my recent classes and I hope you found a lot of value in it. I also wanted to tell you know that one of the things that I'm offering and working with people on right now is a strengths and strategy session is a 90 minute session in which you get access, you do an assessment on your Gallup Clifton strengths, and we go deep. We understand what is happening with you as a leader? What is your management style? How are you showing up within your organization? We also really take note that strengths show up in pairs. So strengths are not to be looked at in isolation, but what happens when you start looking and weaving the power of your different strengths together? And then what is the goal that you have for yourself this year, this month, and how are we using your strengths to get you towards that goal? In addition to your mindset, because they're, you know, for me, we're never doing anything without mindset because my mindset without action means that we're just sitting there having really good thoughts, but not taking action. And then action without mindset means that we're taking action from our current mindset, which may not be serving us. If this is interesting to you, I will put the detail in the show notes. I would love to meet you. I would love to do this work with you. And listen, I've said before, and I'll say it again, that I feel that there is no faster tool than to look at your strengths to create confidence, conviction, and hope. Okay, people, I have so much appreciation that you're here. And listen, if it feels right for you, subscribe. I want to get this word out. I want to continue to make this content free and accessible to as many people as possible. So hit subscribe, give me a review, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon.